as a nation and Niantic people. We honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between the indigenous people and this land by teaching and learning more about their history and present day communities and by becoming stewards of the land we too inhabit. Today's keynote speaker beautifully illustrates all three of our themes for this year's symposium. Language matters, promising practices for measuring success and outcomes and building trust and relationships. We gratefully acknowledge the Rita Allen Foundation for supporting this year's keynote talks. At a more personal level, I have had the honor of being part of the Inclusive Science Communication Planning Committee for now to symposia. And I think today's keynote talk would not be possible if it actually weren't for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so it was back in 2021 when we were brainstorming how we could possibly make our community more inclusive in an all virtual scenario that we started to think about in what ways could we leverage this to grow our community and make it indeed more inclusive. And one of the biggest themes that came up is that our conversations were very global north and very US and maybe a little bit of Canada centric. And so one of our big goals for the symposium back in 2021 was to make it open and accessible for people from all around the world. And I believe we achieved that last time. We had people from the United Kingdom, from Brazil, from Colombia, from South Africa, from other parts of the African continent that joined the symposium at the time. And many of them have actually also chosen to both participate in the virtual version of this year's symposium and come in person, including our esteemed keynote speaker. Um, and just to get a show, this is completely improvised. But um, if you are joining us from not in the United States, can you please raise your hand? So we can see, yes, we have some hands over there. Well, we're so excited that you are here. That is actually very different from what it was like back in 2019. And so I'm originally from Colombia. So at a personal level, I am so excited that today we'll get to hear um, perspectives from somebody who works with communities in the global south. And so our keynote speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Rasekoala, is the president of African Gong, the Pan-African Network for the Popularization of Science and Technology and Science Communication. Dr. Rasekoala is a veteran science communication scholar and practitioner based in South Africa. She is also the editor of this amazing new book, The Race and Sociocultural Inclusion in Science Communication, Innovation, decolonization, decolonization, and Transformation. This book assembled 30 diverse practitioners and academics from across both the Global North and the Global South to present empowering ideas and transformative concepts about inclusive science communication. Today, she will share broadly relevant insights and innovative perspectives from this influential collection, paving the way for more globally inclusive, representative, and paradigm-shifting approaches to science communication. For those of you like me who are interested in this book, she will also be signing, and you will have the opportunity to buy your own copy today from 4.30 to 6 p.m. right in this very room. Following Dr. Rasekoala's remarks, we will take questions and I have also been asked to inform you that we're gonna take a group picture. So please do not leave after the questions. And with that, I welcome our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I probably don't even need the speaker because I'm told I've got a voice for the theater. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> he's cracking up, bless it. Oh dear, great. So, thanks for giving us a bit of the history, but my history goes back a bit further. In, 90, in 2017, when I read about this inclusive psychom symposium that was being conceptualized and uh, being a veteran I was like wow people across the other side of the world get it it's a bit like Gladys Knight and uh, the boys to men thing where she said she had to stop on the side of the road when the end of the road music came on and she's like these young people get it. The young people get it. So it, it's affirming. It's like, wow, 
there's a bigger framework. There's a new generation coming on board to take it forward. So that's what it felt like for me in 2017. And uh, to, to know that you had a group here that was taking this seriously, that realized it wasn't just enough to do it as a panel session, to actually give a whole three days to this issue. That's big. That goes beyond the token of the panel sessions that we usually get elsewhere. And uh, it's so critical to how we embed these conversations. So I really want to start off by commending all the co-founders of this platform, because it's not an easy thing to do. It takes courage. It takes imagination. It takes drive. I'm sure someone like Sunshine, she signed her life away. I can tell a fellow one. Yeah. You sign your life away when you start these things. It just takes over. Because for every 20 people who want to come and talk about how wonderful it is, when it's time to get the job done, as they say in Jamaica, it's you one and God. You one and God to do the work. So it's not an easy road to travel. And as someone who's been on the road less traveled, I commend you, I honor you, and I salute you. And what I would like to do in this presentation is to strengthen the rationale for your work, to show why your platform is so important for the science communication field and hopefully to give you a bit of encouragement and a pat on the back to say, keep going. It's not over until we're six foot under the ground. And even then, I'm sure when I'm down there, my, my bones, my skeletons will still be talking about science communication because it's that wired, absolutely. So if you see a gravestone anywhere, and they're talking molecules and whatever you like. That was Liz Rasekwala in there, exactly. So we start off with the saying that timing is everything, just as we have been told. And the timing of this book really is no different because it was midwifed out of the COVID scenario where you had this glaring global spotlight that the pandemic has shown on all kinds of science, science communication, global inequalities of regions, of geography, the North versus the South and so on, race and socioeconomic divides. And rightly so, because it was life and death. These were life and death implications of these inequalities across the globe. Who lived, who died, who was a first responder or not? who could get a vaccine and who couldn't get one because their country did not get the free supplies and could not afford to buy them. These are profound issues. So we cannot then come out of this scenario and carry on with business as usual. No way, no way. Something has to change and through that, the whole book was conceptualized to say, how do we interrogate our practices, our narratives, and our approaches through more wider angled equity lenses that COVID has shown us do matter. They matter. And so we then tried to come up across the different regions of the globe with a globally inclusive analysis, description, elaboration, and more importantly, to try to map a way forward with innovation and transformative good practice approaches for change. But we already had a wonderful advocate for the premise of what we were doing. And we took the profound exhortation from the late great, as we say, Maya Angelou. And she said something very, very pithy, short, 
But as we say in my language, it gets you in the belly. You reach belly, in our pidgin English, you reach belly. Yeah. And she said, we can only do the best we can until we know better. And that once we know better, we must also then do better. And it is in this context of knowing better in order to do better that we came up with this book volume. And so I would like to share with you all what we now know better and can therefore do better in inclusive science communication. And I want to wrap this up and frame it around these three excellent thematic pillars of this symposium. Language matters, promising practices for measuring success and outcomes, and building trust and relationships. So language matters. Indeed it does. Indeed it does. And we have learned how the global hegemony of European languages. And I have to smile sometimes because our Spanish colleagues forget that Spanish is a European language. It's not a Latin American language. Yeah. We have many blind spots in terms of understanding hegemony. So in this case, predominantly English have systematically undermined the space for local and indigenous languages to flourish within science communication. And it's not just a profound loss and disconnection for people in the global South. Billions of people living with the legacy of colonialism, but across the global North, we are finding that historical and contemporary migration patterns mean that those demographic changes are now impacting on those groups. And if we know nothing, we know that one of the biggest game changers of the 21st century is going to be migration. We are going to see global migration on scales that we have never seen before, driven by so many different factors climate change being one of the additional factors on top of what was driving migration. So get ready, folks. Get ready. Because these people don't come empty. They carry their cultures with them. They carry their language with them. They carry their history with them. How are they going to be included in this space, in your space? You have to think ahead. You have to be ahead of the game. Because the numbers, the challenges will only grow with time. So language matters. And in his book, we heard from him yesterday, Moving the Center, the Struggle for Cultural Freedoms, the African intellectual and activists of language rights, Ungugi Wationgo writes, Yesterday, we heard him talking about decolonizing the mind. Today, I want to quote about him on his other important part of his work, which is about fighting for language rights to the point that he decided to practice what he preached and refused to write any more books in English. And all his subsequent books were written in his uh, uh, indigenous language. And what does he say about language? Very, very deep and challenging. Every language has two aspects. One aspect is its role as an agent that enables us to communicate with one another in our struggle to find means for survival. The other is its role as a carrier of the history and culture built into the process of that communication over time. So what is Ngugi actually telling us about the power of language and why it matters? It is through language that some people may seek to preserve power and privilege. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar? We see that? 
while others may engage in efforts to challenge that power. Language is therefore shaped by, finds a home in, and flourishes in political and economic structures of power and privilege. And in almost all societies, language forms part of the intersection between race, nationality, and social class. So that as one of the chapters illustrates with the question, can you really understand science concepts if you cannot explain them in your own local language? I can speak to my family about any topic in my language. As soon as I have to start talking about science, guess what? We go into English. And that is a loss. That is a loss that we live with. Why am I not enabled to be able to speak about science to my family, to my grandmother, in my local language? It's a profound loss to live with. The other aspect as to why language matters relates to the concept of what post-colonial scholars such as Edward Said and Gloria Werke write about the concept of racial grammar. The racial grammar that is inherent in the cultural archives through which much of science communication is undertaken, articulated, framed, and lauded to a certain extent in the mainstream. And what is the power of racial grammar? Because it works on two levels. Racial grammar is used to define and to preserve the superiority of so-called Western knowledge and communication against other parts of the world. Racial grammar frames the way in which Western-derived science communication practices have been privileged at the expense of those from other cultures, serving to make invisible their added value dimensions of the contributions to a globally coherent and inclusive framework for science communication. And here I go to my mother's language. My father's language is what I call straight speak. This is me as a child now. My mother's language is what I call half speak because in her language, you have to, it's a whole different way of listening and speaking because you have to listen to what is said and what is not said. Yo, hard work, that's hard work. And I remember as a child saying, but mom, why, why can't I say that? And she said, no, my child, you can't say that. You've got to say some things and then that other person has to listen and work it out. And it's like, who needs the hard work? Can we just put it out there? No, half speak. A whole different mind game. But when you've lived that as a child, you learn to see half speak in other arenas. And I saw half speak in the racial grammar of science communication. It operates at the level of what is said and what is said, the negation, the denigration of the contributions of non-Western societies, regions to scientific advancement. And as in my mother's language, what is not said? The hidden stories, the hidden figures. Remember the book and the film? Yeah. Uh -huh. The narratives, the exemplars of the contributions of these very same marginalized people and regions that are insidiously unacknowledged, unnamed, and buried in this racial grammar of half speak. So just as with my mother's language, 
you have to listen very, very carefully to understand that there are two levels here. What is overtly said and what is not said. And you've got to work both out for you to fully then understand what the grammar is. And this half speak is so powerfully illustrated and captured in the work of a, the Caribbean born American artist, Tavares Strachan, who is an alumni of the Rhodes Island School of Design, as it happens. These connections always happen like that. And uh, he came up with what he called the Encyclopedia of Invisibility. 15,000 examples from across the globe, 2,416 pages, the Encyclopedia of Invisibility to evidence the recovery of invisible facts and histories. And in his exhibition, that fat book sits behind, sorry, sits behind glass. You can't open it. You get the message? He's telling you, this is what it is for real. This is what is not said. Even while it's captured in this book. And you look at the physical frustration of people who want to go in there and grab the book and this knowledge, and they can't because there's glass. Can you see the power of what that artist is trying to teach us about what we are dealing with in the racial grammar? Yes, absolutely. So this half speak needs to be overturned. And how do we do that? By enhancing resonance and relevance in science communication through revising and revisioning the social cultural archives, broadening them, widening them, making them much more globally inclusive that we utilize in framing science communication discourses and narratives. Promising practices for measuring success and outcomes. What did we come up with here? The challenge for science communication in this context of measuring success and impact outcomes is innovatively Im embedded in our recommendation of moving from measuring quantity, raw numbers, how many people attend. If you're lucky, you might get a gender disaggregated breakdown. So many women, so many males. To move from raw numbers, which is the current dominant paradigm to that of measuring quality. And quality is harder, but it is much more nuanced, transformative and inclusive. So the challenge we put in this book is that when we take this approach to its ultimate, what does this recommendation actually seek to, 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 to do? It seeks to put forward the radical suggestion that there should be only one valid impact measure for successful science communication. And guess what that is? That of inclusivity. Can we be bold enough to envisage a brave new world where the metrics of diversity, equity, and inclusion become the principal hallmarks through which we evaluate and assess what success outcomes in science communication look like and their sustainable impacts. Can we be bold enough to say, if it's not inclusive, it's rubbish. I don't wanna know whether 200,000 people came. If it's not inclusive, it's rubbish. It did not happen. Go back and start again. Can we do that? Call each other to account? Because that's what needs to happen. And if we don't do that, what happens? 
we carry on with this scenario that has been there for far too long, whereby inclusion has been and continues to be viewed as an optional extra, an afterthought, or a nice to have. Where the evaluation of science communication is concerned, we're going to keep being in this arena if we don't have this radical change to how we approach things. But we have a lot of enemies on the road. So let's talk about what we have to deal with to get there. We have the gatekeepers and we know them well. <laughs> so let's talk about them so we know who we're gonna hit hard. <laughs> exactly, if we're gonna make this happen. In the global south, we have the insidious Trojan horse of international partnerships driven by Global North funders and which pressurize our researchers, our academics and science communicators to deliver science communication through ways and means and approaches that mimic their international partners in these globalized unequal partnerships whereby power dynamics and decision-making are driven by the Global North Funders Partners. So what do we have? In effect, we inexorably move from the term helicopter, helicopter science research, as it has been described, to helicopter science communication in the Global South. And my visual of the helicopter syndrome always goes back to those, I don't know if it's appropriate, but I'll say it anyway, those Vietnam movies. A helicopter doesn't have to land. It can drop people and pick them up. It's an appropriate analogy. A plane has to land to be able to to do something similar. So remember the helicopter analogy. In the global north, science communicators like yourselves are faced with a science communication policy space, space which though robust in its broad implementation and resourcing frameworks, still very much pays tokenistic lip service to and articulates empty rhetoric where the imperatives, values, and priorities of inclusive science communication are concerned. So those are the gatekeepers we have in the North and South. And we then have to have a strategy as to how we overcome them to actually transform the better ways that we measure inclusive science communication. So the third pillar is about building trust and relationships. And we found that these operate on three levels, these critical dimensions. The first one that we ask is how can science communicators in both the global North and South engender trust and co-engagement with the marginalized groups, communities in science communication. The key change agent here is the willingness of science communicators in both regions we found to share power, devolve autonomy and authority. Mm -hmm. Hard words, very difficult to do to co-design and co-evaluate science communication practices, narratives, and methodologies with these marginalized communities. And phew, it's much easier said than done. It trips off the tongue nice. <laughs> it's very hard to do. Very hard to share power. Very hard to devolve authority. Because we come with the arrogance that we know best. Yeah, 
I remember this quip we used to have in the colonial days where we used to say, white man knows best. Yeah, now it's, yeah, scientists know best. And that's the problem. How do we move away from that mindset uh, that the public are empty vessels that we have to fill? It's almost like you, we go to the public and we want to slice off the top of their heads and then open it up, pour in science communication, slap it back in again, stitch up the head and say, that's it, you are sorted. You have been science communicated too. Now, now, yeah, now go home. Yeah, go home and sit down and make the, 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 the behavior change. And people are like, excuse me? What about what I came with? Mm -mm, we don't want to know that. Uh -uh, no, that's, that's confusing. We're going to open your head, pour it in, stitch it up, and you go home. We don't want to know what you have to say, what you're coming with. It feels like that sometimes. It does. The second aspect to this challenge is how can the science communication field build equitable collaborative partnerships between practitioners in the global North and South? Meaning, how do we overcome the seemingly entrenched global North-South inequitable divide and work together to overcome the hegemony of Western Eurocentricism in science communication? which has such detriment, detrimental impacts across the globe where inclusive science communication is concerned. One of the ways forward we suggest is in establishing new forms of cross-regional engagements, forums as mechanisms of establishing and sustaining critical reconciliation, mediation, and recalibration contact zones. And those three words are critical. Reconciliation, because we have much to reconcile. Much damage has been done. People have been hurt, there is hurt. We have to talk about reconciliation. Mediation, how do we come together? And recalibration, because there's a lot of pseudo-historical memory. Oh yes, pseudo-historical memory. When the white folks came there, there was nobody on the land. The land was empty. Excuse me, where were we? Where were we? The land was empty. That's why we took it over. Uh-huh. Uh all we found were the animals. There were no people there. We've all heard those pseudo-historical revisions, haven't we? Yes. Yeah. All those lands were empty. Yeah. Only the turkeys were there. Mm. So these contact zones between science communication professionals from the global north and south can, in time, and with increasing trust, mutual learning, dialogue, and respectful listening, respectful listening, because there's listening and there's respectful listening. As my mom would remind me with a half speak. Mm -hmm. So that these become cohesive engines for driving innovation, shared activism, and collective action in inclusive science communication globally. The third aspect to these dimensions of building trust and relationships that we identified relates to the critical elements of capacity building. And what do we mean by capacity building? What we're talking about here is how do we grow the knowledge, aptitude, skill sets and mindset changes of current and future science communication professionals in order to establish and sustain a critical mass of practitioners, academics, and researchers 
who are not only trained and inculcated firmly in the paradigms of inclusive science communication, but are able to independently operate as agents of change. And this speaks to the simple adage that you cannot give what you ain't got, if I put my Americanism in there, what you ain't got, yeah. How do we expect practitioners to engage in these transformative approaches when most of them have not been enabled through capacity building or training to deliver on these premises? So when we look globally across the North and South, there has been a proliferation of science communication courses at graduate, undergraduate, and postgraduate levels. But as we have shown in, the, in this book, they have not in the main been able to bring to the fore or to center the imperatives of inclusive science communication in their curricula or in their research methods, in their teaching texts, resource materials, and so on. So when you stand back, you almost have to ask the real challenging question of, do we actually need to go back to square one and operate on a training the trainers? Yeah, because the trainers we have, they're not up to the job. They're not up to the job. In order to move away from the syndrome of the blind leading the half blind, because that's what we have now. Who are the trainers training these students in these undergraduate and master's courses in science communication? So if we don't do that, given the lack of knowledge of these trainers, then how do we inculcate inclusive science communication? So one of the chapters, the lead author is a student from one of these postgraduate courses, an explainer in a science center in a country in the global south. And she was frustrated because she had to campaign to do her research module in her cultural space. And the university wouldn't let her initially because the curriculum was so Eurocentric and her argument was, I'm an explainer in a science center in a rural part of my country. What am I gonna take back with for my culture, for my people? Do I just go with an empty degree that says I have an MSc or whatever in science communication? And she had to bring in an external supervisor from a university in her country and the support of her supervisor in that university. But why did she have to do that? That is a very clear sign of what is missing, what is so wrong in these training courses. And the danger is that they simply entrench poor practices and further reinforce Eurocentric hegemonic thinking and practices in their students, who then become the new emerging and future generations of practitioners in the field. And so we perpetuate the cycle of more of the same, dumb and dumber. And what we then did was to highlight good practice exemplars of innovations that are taking place in different parts of the globe. And you can read more about those. But there is change. And there are institutions that are challenging this dumb and dumber approach and the blind leading the half blind approach. Because it was quite clear that this young female student was way ahead of all her supervisors where inclusive SICOM was concerned. So you beg the question, what was she doing in that course? She should have been teaching it. Never mind being a student. In conclusion then, colleagues, our framing of the book, Race and Sociocultural Inclusion in Science Communication 
innovation, decolonization, and transformation was fundamentally about placing at the center of inclusive science communication, the restoration of a sense of an actual dignity for black, indigenous, and people of color across both the global North and South as a foundation of how we understood the struggle for diversity, equity, and inclusion in science communication. We have articulated and framed a far-sighted response, challenging and radical responses to hundreds of years of colonial and racist systematic marginalization in the scientific enterprise and its communication. I cannot see how we can talk about social cohesion and development across the globe without consciously thinking about how inclusive about how inclusive science communication feeds into the socio-political cultural nexus of everyday life. It is equally difficult to see how we can eventually become a globally inclusive field when we focus on inclusive science communication as a luxury a nice to have, or we come up with apologies. Oh, ain't it a shame? This is beyond shame, folks. We gotta get the work done. If we fail to specifically identify this as a socio-political, ethical, and moral imperative, then we are simply and tokenistically participating in verbal gymnastics to try to solve a problem we refuse to name. We refuse to name. And that is why we named it right on the front of that book. Mm -hmm. So that as my dear mother would say, and she loved Stevie Wonder, she would say, even Stevie Wonder can see it, my child. We need to name the problem that we're dealing with. So we also believe that such a change in outlook would positively influence how we understand solutions to challenges of engendering public trust and enable us to build ethical foundations solidarity, and a sense of collective responsibility. We must dare to imagine a world in which the narratives and practices of race and sociocultural inclusion in science communication are fully centered at the core of inclusive science communication rather than at its margins. There is no glory none whatsoever, in lauding the growing global footprint of science communication. When this advancement has been achieved at the profound cost of cultural diversity, localization of contexts, language, plurality, and other critically unique social justice and empowering approaches, across the regions of the world. We believe that it is these very same ethical norms and ethos of transformative, decolonized science communication that can help us all to build a radically cohesive, globally inclusive framework in which we see inclusive science communication as the indisputable hallmark of excellence in our field. If it is not inclusive, rubbish. Go back, start again. It is then when we hold each other to account as exhorted by Maya Angelou that we can create a dynamic framework in which we can all become should 
and must do better. I thank you. Is this on? Can you all hear me? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rasekwala, again for those wonderful remarks. We now open the floor for questions and we have a while. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. So just raise your hand and I will come find you. <laughs> Can you please raise your hand again? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, your talk. Um, a question about lost languages, uh, particularly intergenerationally. So when that language has been removed and the practitioners don't, can, it may be irrecoverable to them either through distance um, can you speak a little bit about restoring languages to science that maybe feel intractably far away, either through time or space? Okay. So we take two more and then I answer three together so that we save okay. time. Mm -hmm. so I'm okay. amazed you can remember three in a row. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I have maybe actually a related question mm -hmm. and I was really... Um, struck by your comment that you switched to English with your own family to speak about mm -hmm. science and wonder if you'd be willing to say a little bit more about that in, in concrete terms. What are the obstacles and why that switch? Okay. Do we have a third oh. question? So we're on language matters. <laughs> okay. On Should I go ahead and answer those two? Yeah. It's a good question. And the basic reason is that Certainly in, 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 in our case, African languages were marginalized in the education space. So it was English in the Anglophone countries and French in the Francophone countries and Portuguese in the Lusophone countries and so on. So that while we have a vocabulary for our indigenous knowledge in our local language, we are just about beginning to develop the vocabulary in the formal science space. And this is why one of the gateways that we keep trying to push forward is that of mainstreaming our indigenous knowledge into that space. Because if we can do that, we then begin to create that sort of parity that leveraging, are you with me? That advocacy and recognition and validation. So in our indigenous knowledge spaces, our indigenous science, we are well capable of communicating that in our local languages, because that's our history, that's our culture. It's the formal science. You learn it in school in English, all the way from primary school, high school, university, it's in English. I'm still trying to work out what a retort flask, how you say that in my language. Never mind full speak or half speak. Yeah, so it's, it's tough. It's a whole vocabulary development, yes, that, that needs to happen. Yeah, but in the indigenous knowledge space, that, that is totally there yeah and uh, we're starting with things I'm aware of a certain institution that is trying to translate the the periodic table into one of our African languages which would be very interesting to see <laughs> yeah so there's some movement there but if we can mainstream our indigenous knowledge that begins to create those what I call recalibration Mediation, yeah, reconciliation, contact zones, yes. Yeah. The lady there had a hand up? Yeah. Thank you again for 
the amazing talk. So the question that I have for you is for people who are like me, right? Who are, who's a woman of color, who works in the science space, Mm -hmm. but often like in my previous life, I used to work in global HIV work, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. Are there strategies that you can think of or things that we should be considering as, yes, I am a person of color here, but not the, the same color, not the same culture, I'm not the same anything else as the people who I work with or a strategy are the ways that you can think about or give us strategies on how do we decolonize our own minds as people of color, as people who have an identity that might be more marginalized without putting that harm onto other folks as well, like unwittingly becoming colonizers yeah. in this space. That's a very good question because it goes to one of the, 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 the kind of what I call the cross-cultural challenges that we have even within the, the what we call the, the, the race space. So when we look at the African diaspora, whether it's the historical one or the contemporary one, and we look at uh, the people on the African continent, we know that to a certain extent, there has been that disconnect. And so what we are actually suggesting here is that once you center race and social cultural inclusion, what you actually do is you enable all those different trajectional experiences to be equally engaged so that your experiences as a person of color, whether you've come through the, and I'm being diplomatic now to say the historical route, but we know it was a brutal, experience, historical migration or contemporary migration or those on the African continent. But until we can center race, there is no space for you, for me, or any other. And that's the problem. Because when we center it, then you and I then have the opportunity to be able to engage freely and to be able to talk across. And we will be surprised at how much synergy we find. Absolutely. But we don't even have that space, my dear. And that's got to be the starting point. Yeah. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, great. I have a question from our virtual audience. When we talk about inclusive science, how do we separate the systems of oppression from that? Because to be included in a system that holds power over others defeats the purpose of it being inclusive and truly equitable. And this is a question from someone online? Yes. Oh, good. Again, a very, very good question. And a difficult one to answer because I understand the premise of that question. It reminds me of the sort of questions that we used to have on the gender space back in the day. Should women do their own thing in their own space or should they try to get into these spaces that are dominated by men? Which one do you go for? But the answer, as challenging as it is, is that inclusive science communication has got to be made to work on those wider lenses of equity, or else it's not worth the name. And my fear is that we're getting into a kind of a comfort zone by traipsing everything as inclusive science communication. We're becoming blinkered. And we don't even realize that we could end up in a silo. So I understand the, the concern inherent in that question, that if you're going into positions of power, how do you change the paradigm? You have to be engaged. Just as women knew that they had to be engaged in those spaces of men for change to happen, Yes, I can understand people who think you can change it from outside, but you also have to be inside. You got to have skin in the game, as you guys say over here. Yeah, you need to have skin in the game. And you can only do that by going in. But her question is also 
a backlash to us in inclusive science communication to say, we have to widen the lens. Going back to that question, if we don't widen the lens, we are just another set of hypocritical gatekeepers. And that's where we're going. That's where we're going, folks. If we are not careful, if we don't move out of our comfort zones. So thanks to, to uh, our colleague with that very profound question. It wants asking, and I wish I had longer to answer. There's two ladies there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was looking at the color. Um, so as a scientist, um, one of the core features that I've always sort of practiced and learned is um, of every across research disciplines mm -hmm. is this idea of cla uh, classification and categorization as a style of scientific reasoning. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the prime examples of that is the periodic table, mm -hmm. right? classifying categorize once you mm -hmm. can sort of name things then you can measure it and such and such and go on with your experiments however over the last few days i've been really reflecting on this idea of classification and cat and categorization mm -hmm. because everything that i've learned has always been classified and categorized in through a western lens mm -hmm. right so i guess it's sort of related to the question that was mm -hmm. just asked but you know you spoke about the periodic table uh, being translated into other languages. And mm. to me, that that like the system that's used for the classification and categorization of the periodic tables completely based on like, you know, molecular weights of, and it's like one, two, three, four, five, you know, so it's in this. So I, I don't know if that's like not culturally, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because uh, I'm, you know, obviously a white lady here. Yeah. And um, so I guess my question is, 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 you know, in the systems that we have is simply just creating the communication of these systems in in heritage languages like enough or is it also about trying to identify what systems of classification and categorization exist mm. in other cultures yeah you know yeah uh do you want to take that one or let me answer first which one yeah no that's a good question because the the, the challenge is both ways the challenge is what's out there within the sort of the, the normative uh, um, scenarios, like you say, with the periodic table. But it's also the challenge of different kinds of sensitivities and sensibilities in different languages and culture. So let me give you an interesting example here. So when in the early days when we had the, the big challenge of HIV AIDS, and there was a great uh, drive in terms of public health, messaging, science communication, and again, Western derived concepts were sort of driving the agenda. And these uh, international well-intentioned folks would come to us and say, yes, we want you to be talking to people about this, that, and the other, and, you know, talking about the anatomical parts and being diplomatic now. Is it lunchtime? We had, had lunch. Yeah. And we're like, excuse me, dear, anatomical parts. In some of our languages, there is such a sensitivity about what I call what happens in the bedroom department. Mm hmm. So we don't even go for the biological anatomical names. So in some languages, it is as obscure as he took her to the bedroom and he fell on top of her. And that's it. So how do you then take this Western Eurocentric language and approach to these communities? So it was about understanding that some of the challenges come from this other way, that certain societies and communities have their delicacies and ways of talking about certain things, maybe not as freely or as openly as in the Western world. And, but again, this evolves over time. People forget how these things evolved um, in the European arena. 
I mean, for heaven's sake, where did chastity belts come from? Are you with me? Yeah. This, the, the, societies evolve. And we know that our societies will also evolve. Some of these societies, the language will evolve to being more about the anatomical part, you know? Yeah, over time. So it's a two-way street. We need to find that leveraging within the mainstream, but we also need to respect and give space for cultures and societies to evolve their language and their sensibilities and sensitivities to some of these scientific concepts. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> So next time you want to talk about mm, S-E-X, it's he took her to a room and fell on top of her. Yeah, yeah. It's a long way around to say the same thing. But you get the visual, don't you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So thank you. Mm -hmm. My question was actually very similar. So uh -huh. I wanted to perhaps pass the mic if someone has a different question. We probably only have time for one last question. So we'll do your question and then Rob. <laughs> oh dear. Thank you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so wonderful talk. I wanted to briefly ask about when you're talking about the Encyclopedia of Visibility mm -hmm. and that art project that reminded me a lot of the film, um, The Watermelon Woman by mm -hmm. Cheryl Gunye which is a uh, spoiler if no one's seen it. It was made in the 90s, but basically a whole idea of finding this historical uh, Black woman um, that mm. actually never existed. And it, the film ends with that mm. notion of when your history has been robbed from you, um, mm. sometimes you have to create your own. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of new knowledge and a lot of really great steps that are being generated now to, in terms of science communication and just science in general. What kind of strategies do you think are necessary for people to take in place now to ensure that those histories and those new creations are not lost like the original ones were? That makes sense. Yeah, again, the answer is on two levels. And the, the Strachan exhibit, by putting that huge encyclopedia behind glass, so that people can actually touch it and read it. He is exemplifying the first part of the problem, which is the gatekeeping that wants to keep that knowledge invisible. So it's like a physical illustration. So how do we open those gates? Because it's, it's one thing on the other hand, to create those stories, to bring to life those exemplars, as you say, to showcase those exam ex examples. But do we get a way in? Is the door open? That's the, so it's, it's two ways. It's two ways. And that's the challenge. So there's a lot of work, uh, books like Hidden Figures and the film are doing a lot in terms of getting those stories, getting, breaking down the half speak, but the system, the mainstream, including what we talk about in inclusive science communication, has to open those doors so that those stories can live and breathe within that wider, those, those wider equity lenses. So it's two ways. Yeah. No point doing this if the doors are shut. And no point opening the doors if there's nothing to come in. But as usual, there's more happening on the content side and less happening on the opening the door side. Because again, it's about power, it's about autonomy, it's about privilege. And those are the hardest things to break through. I think now I'm on. And with that, let's thank one last time, Dr. Elizabeth Rasekwala. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay.
And while you are in your seats, please remain in your seats for just a few minutes longer so we can do the picture. And I know probably several of you still want to talk to her some more. Remember, she's going to be selling her book and you'll have an opportunity to chat with her um, for a little bit longer from 4.30 to 6 during her signing. Thank you.